that. Right. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to take several metaphorical steps back um, from what we've been hearing and really talk at a quite different level. My background is more than anything else as an economist. Um, and I'm going to talk about really very much macro and economic trends and how that but I will bring that back, I think, to try and relate that maybe to the issues of overdiagnosis and overtreatment that people are here for today. Um, I'm, I'm now uh, based in Tasmania, the most beautiful island in the world. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge um, the uh, Muwanina people of the Pal Palawa Lutruwita Tasmania nations as the traditional owners of the lands where I conduct my work. So, about three or four hundred years ago, something extraordinary happened. For most of human history, the economy, such as it was, we didn't really think of it as an economy, um, was stable. Nothing much changed. Standards of living didn't change. You would do what your father or your mother did before you, and life went on as it had. And then, primarily, because people started digging up coal, there was a remarkable transformation. And everything changed. Look down in that corner. I don't know, can I get the angle on that? Down there, somewhere in the 1700s, economic growth became exponential. And everything changed. And about a hundred years later, everything changed in human health. Because in much the same way, for several thousand years, on average, you lived as long as your mum or dad did. But then suddenly, life expectancy and many other aspects of human health also started to improve at dramatic, really dramatic speed. And in healthcare, over the same period, we went from this. I'm very fascinated by the guy who's standing behind, just peering over his shoulder, <laughs> to this. In 400 years, robotic surgery, all this fantastic stuff. Um, and yet, here we are today, in 2023, um, and things maybe are not looking quite so rosy. And we have to now ask ourselves, does the arc of history still bend towards progress, but we are just facing a few local difficulties? Or are we actually entering what some have called the age of consequences? What people have been telling us is coming for 50 years as we start to really run out of road on our ecological impact. Um, and this is really what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk about economic growth. I'm going to talk about consumption and overconsumption. And I'm going to try and sketch out a little bit about what that might mean for healthcare and perhaps the future of healthcare. I'm going to start, though, by very briefly telling you um, how conventional economists Neoclassical economists, we have lots of names for different kinds of economists. Neoclassical economics, which is the dominant way of thinking about economics, it's been the dominant form of economics for maybe 150 years. Neoclassical economics thinks of the economy. The world, society, humanity is the economy, and everything else is a subset of the economy. So to neoclassical economics, the natural world is a sector of the economy. It's got a name. It's called the natural resources sector. So everything that we take out of the earth, everything that we dump back in to the natural environment in neoclassical economics, that's just a sector of the economy, like everything else, to be used, extracted, to be managed well, certainly, but it's there to serve the economy. In the 70s, a number of economists started questioning that sort of orthodoxy. 
um, and what has now become a discipline called ecological economics, not to be confused with environmental economics. That's different. The ecological economists started to think about this quite differently, and they made what is perhaps the, the obvious common sense point that, hey, look, it's the other way around. We live on this finite planet, so therefore whatever the economy is, it's actually just a sector of the ecosystem. And they started from that premise and said, well, what then does that m make us need to do differently as we think about economics? Um, but they also made the observation, which is particularly important, that if we think about growth, that incredible exponential economic growth I showed you, in the beginning, growth didn't really matter that much. Even in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we were spewing out soot and the horrific slums of the Industrial Revolution, the scale of the economy was not yet big enough to really materially impact on the natural environment. We were working in what Herman Daly, who has recently died, but the father of ecological economics, called an empty world. But the problem with growth, and especially exponential growth, was that slowly at first, and then faster, in the words of Hemingway, and then all at once, um, the economy started to fill up that natural world. And now we're in a full world where our impacts are pervasive. They're everywhere. You know all the stories. You know how they find plastics and prescription pharmaceuticals in penguins in Antarctica. Um, I think in some ways the most powerful one is this, that if we think of all the mammals on the Earth today, 36% of them, biomass of mammals, is us, humans. 60% is our domestic livestock. Only 4% of the biomass of all mammals alive today are wild mammals. So we have created this full world, and perhaps how we would represent that now, many of you will have seen this, is the, the planetary boundaries framework which shows us on a number of different um, ecological impacts how we are exceeding the safe uh, operating limits or safe carrying capacity, as far as we understand it, of the planet. But this problem is um, deeply, inequitably distributed. So if you look at these, uh, the, these two rings, these are using um, an adaptation of Kate Rayworth's donut framing. Okay, The middle, uh, look at the two rings, you have a green ring, the donut, the green donut in the middle. Inside the donut is measures of the social foundations of the economy, so life expectancies in there, lots of other measures like education, all kinds of things like that. The outer ring of the green donut is the ecological ceiling, the safe boundary ecologically. So in my country, Australia, we are way over the ecological safe operating space in all but one of those categories. But we do have fantastic um, measures of social de development. On the right-hand side, we've got Sri Lanka, very far from being the poorest country in the world, a long way from being the poorest country in the world, yet they um, are not transgressing any of their planetary boundaries, but nor are they meeting the basic needs of their population. So we have this terrible um, dilemma at the moment, which we're grappling with, which is at the centre of what I'll be talking about, of is it possible and how can we meet the basic needs of all humans without transgressing those ecological planetary boundaries. And that will require us to think quite differently about economics and what economics does. So neoclassical economics is pretty simple. It sees its mission as the study of the allocation of scarce resources among unlimited wants. That's the textbook definition we teach a new undergraduate. 
Um, it's all about the efficient allocation of resources. But there are quite powerful voices now saying that's not enough, that's not necessarily even the right focus. So particularly feminist economists have turned that around and said no, the economy actually must serve society and therefore economics needs to be about the study of our social provisioning systems, the systems that give us life as a society. And ecological economists take that a step further and say economics is not just about efficiency, even though it does have to be about efficiency. We never want to use resources inefficiently, but it's also about what is the sustainable scale of the economy, how big can our economy safely be, and about the fair distribution of those resources within and between countries and between those who have caused the ecological crisis we find ourselves and those who have not benefited yet from the economic growth that drove that crisis. And a key concept which I think is really central to where this work links with um, issues of overdiagnosis, overtreatment, etc., is Herman Daly's concept of uneconomic growth. We understand what economic growth is. It's the economy getting bigger every year. Okay. Daly's insight, though, was that um, in economics, if there's a real law in economics, it's the law of diminishing marginal returns. So the more and more you get of something, the less and less value or utility each extra unit, in fact, brings you. Um, and as the economy has grown over the years, the utility, the marginal utility of each extra unit of growth has gone down and down. The additional value that each unit of growth brings to society gets less. And with it, as the economy grows, there is also marginal disutility, bad things, obviously pollution, but also all kinds of other negative impacts which have come with growth. And Daly's insight was that there's a point where the marginal utility, the extra benefit of growth, equals the marginal disutility the marginal harm of growth. And once we've reached that point, growth is no longer economic, it's now uneconomic. We're still making the economy bigger and bigger every year, but we're actually literally causing more harm than good after that point. And that's been a key insight which is now driving big debates about really what is the future of the economy. Can or should growth actually continue? And I'll come back and talk very briefly about some of the risks of not continuing growth. Um, can we have green growth? Could we still continue to grow the, the value and the benefits of the economy, but in a green and sustainable way? Is that actually going to be possible? Um, Many people are beginning to question whether just going green and making everything renewable, etc., either is actually feasible, but also can achieve the full level of reduction in ecological harms that we need to achieve to get out of the mess. So others are talking about post-growth models of the economy, models in which the economy no longer grows, or even may need to degrow. And degrowth in particular is something that uh, in Europe now is a really quite significant movement. And in the background, whatever we might like to do is the spectre of um, what is at risk if we fail to resolve these problems, um, which is do we actually risk what some have called more politely involuntary degrowth, or a bit more brutally, collapse. And in a collapse situation, believe me, the last thing we're going to be worrying about is over-diagnosis and over-treatment. 
So we really want to avoid that kind of a situation. So who's this bloke who's running out of time? And um, what has this got to do with healthcare? Well, let me try and answer that qu quite quickly. So even though we've come to this, perhaps we're approaching some crisis point of economic growth. In fact, even though all our politicians talk about growth all the time, the truth is the rate of growth has declined every decade that probably almost everybody in this room has been alive. Growth has got slower and slower globally and particularly in the high income countries. Yet, our spending on healthcare has consumed a bigger and bigger proportion of the economy over that time. Those of you from the States understand this, now tracking towards 19% of GDP. But even in other high income countries, steady, steady growth, so typically around 10% of GDP now go, uh, is healthcare expenditure. Um, and We've actually understood in healthcare for many years that it's possible, indeed likely, that healthcare, like everything else, has diminishing marginal returns. This is Don Obedian's work from 1980, where he was setting out this framework suggesting that after a certain point, extra healthcare is likely to add less and less and eventually negative benefit. So some of the things I'm working on is really trying to say how does this bigger picture of overconsumption and uneconomic growth drive through to health and healthcare? So one of the frameworks that I've developed and that we're trying to work with is this one, looking at concept of overconsumption and what's called failure demand. The idea of failure demand, particularly in healthcare, is that it's a demand for a good or a service, in this case healthcare, which is being driven by demand which actually could have been avoided. Okay? And um, it's driven from two directions. So out there in the wider economy, we have all sorts of harms being driven, firstly by overconsumption, simply consuming too much. So obviously we've got fossil fuels. Um, too much fossil fuels has led to carbon, carbon pollution, etc. Fossil fuels are not a bad thing. If we hadn't had coal, we would not have had that revolution in life expectancy. But we've overconsumed them, and now we're getting in trouble. We also have a something called misconsumption, which is actually our tendency to consume things which are just bad for us, whether that's smoking cigarettes, um, social media, anybody, all of those things. And they're driving avoidable health harms, which make people sick, which drive them into the healthcare system, and which people in this room, no better than me, then drive them through all kinds of opportunities for further harm, either from inappropriate, unnecessary care, and or from low quality care. And that drives people back round then through this cycle of failure demand, um, just looping people through, all the while causing all the environmental impacts from healthcare that Forbes was talking about. So we can think about how we might uh, drive some of these things down by acting on these social determinants of health, acting on... Um, primary prevention, chronic disease management, all of these things to minimize avoidable demand for healthcare, whilst at the same time we minimize the production emissions and production pollution of our healthcare system. But that's kind of a reductionist view. It's important, but it's only one dimension. We also need to think about how much is enough healthcare and if you'll indulge me one extra minute, I'll land this reasonably on time. Um, we've looked here at healthcare expenditure. Uh, each of those dots is a country um, or against total healthcare expenditure per capita, against health adjusted life expectancy on the left, and mortality amenable to healthcare on the right. And we've looked at what's the pattern we're seeing here. And very simply, oops, sorry, wrong button. 
If we look at health-adjusted life expectancy, and we see the same thing in reverse, more health-adjusted life expectancy is good, less uh, amenable mortality is good. Um, the poorest countries, as you spend more on health care, you get massive increases. It's associated with massive increases in health-adjusted life expectancy, reducing mortality, etc. Then, after some point, at a really quite low level of health ex healthcare expenditure, around four or five hundred dollars per capita, that additional benefit starts to slow. We're in a, in a zone of diminishing marginal returns. We're still getting additional health benefit, but it's slowing down. And then somewhere, and you know, don't take this too literally, but somewhere up here, which is in the kind of healthcare expenditure levels we see. In when we these data are from in southern European countries, we get to a level beyond which additional health care certainly isn't getting you more benefit and might actually be, let's not say causing harm, but associated with lower overall benefits. We see a similar kind of pattern. This is much ropier data, but this is about healthcare greenhouse gas emissions. And above a certain point, more greenhouse gas emissions is absolutely not associated with better health. So this all looks a bit, to me, like this uneconomic growth um, phenomenon. And healthcare, uh, alas, I don't have solutions for you, but healthcare is actually a fantastic example of uneconomic growth. And that is one of the things that we're using it for. Um, and the challenge really becomes, um, this, a huge number of people in the world, at least two billion people in the world, are a very long way from having anything like ac acceptable access to basic health care. So a huge population still needs much more health care than they need today. But many of the richest in the world probably are consuming too much. So how then do we start to define the minimum necessary and maximum desirable levels of health care within countries and across countries? And how do we create both the ecological and the fiscal space to let us do that? And I'll stop there because I know I'm out of time, but perhaps I do did have a couple of not brilliant, but possible ideas on some of the first steps that we might take. We can maybe talk about that in the panel.